More than two decades after it first aired, HBO's Band of Brothers remains a seminal work of television. The passage of time means that the soldiers depicted in the show have passed. However, many of the core members depicted in the series lived into the 21st century, even well past the on-screen interviews they did for Band of Brothers. The last living member of Easy Company, Private First Class Bradford Freeman, died on July of 2022, 78 years after D-Day. So, 22 years after the show originally aired, let's see how some of the real-life soldiers compared to their on-screen depictions. 1. Outstanding Veterans, Major Dick Winters Kicking off our Distinguished Veterans series is Major Richard Dick Winters, the leader of Easy Company in the 2nd Battalion, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, part of the renowned Screaming Eagles, 101st Airborne Division. Winters was known for his remarkable leadership and unwavering respect for his troops, leaving an indelible mark on the lives of his soldiers and the future of our nation. Born on January 21, 1918, in New Holland, Pennsylvania, Dick had an extraordinary upbringing with his parents, Richard Sr. and Edith. In 1937, he enrolled at Franklin and Marshall College, a private liberal arts university in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in economics. After completing his education, in the summer of 1941, Winters made the decision to enlist in the United States Army. He noted in his journal, I had no desire to get into the war, but he chose to serve to fulfill the mandatory one-year service requirement imposed by the recently enacted Selective Training and Service Act of 1940, America's first peacetime conscription law. Winters enlisted just seven days after President Roosevelt signed the Service Extension Act of 1941 into law on August 18th, which extended the draft period to 30 months for those conscripted. However, as a volunteer and not a draftee, Winters' commitment remained at the original 12-month term. This changed after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, when the United States officially entered World War II, leading to an increase in the number of draftees and changes in the rules governing their service. In September 1941, Winters began his basic training at Camp Croft, South Carolina. His natural leadership qualities and good-natured demeanor earned him the admiration and respect of fellow trainees. Recognizing his potential, camp officials recruited Winters as an instructor while the rest of his unit was deployed to Panama. In April 1942, Winters was selected to attend Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia, where he crossed paths with Lewis Nixon, a fellow future officer and lifelong friend. During OCS, Winters decided to pursue paratrooper training, a designation that had only recently become available with the formation of the Army's new Airborne Forces. Upon his graduation from OCS, Winters was commissioned as a second lieutenant and sent to complete additional paratrooper training at Tamp, Tocoa, Georgia. After five intense weeks of training, Winters was assigned to the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, specifically to Easy Company. The 506th PIR was an experimental regiment that attracted courageous volunteers who had met the rigorous criteria for paratrooper training. This specialized training encompassed a wide range of skills, including parachute maintenance, aircraft exits, safe landing techniques, terrain analysis, and, in true Army fashion, strenuous physical conditioning. Out of the initial 5,000 officers who began the training, only 148, including Winters, successfully completed the program. In total, out of the original class, a mere 1,800 were deemed fit to serve as paratroopers. In the fall of 1943, the 506th PIR arrived in Liverpool to join the ranks of Major General William Lee's company, the illustrious 101st Airborne. Relentless and thorough training commenced for Winters and the 506th. All in preparation, 
for the grand Allied invasion of Europe. However, amidst this rigorous preparation, a storm brewed within the unit. First Lieutenant Herbert Sobel, who had command over the 506th, had a turbulent relationship with Winters during their stay in England. While Winters was admired by the men of the company for his cheerful and unpretentious nature, Sobel harbored suspicions that Winters might leverage this affection for personal gain, a notion far from Winters' true intentions. Winters did possess reservations about Sobel's capability to effectively lead the company into battle, a sentiment shared by many others in the unit. Sobel attempted to have Winters court-martialed twice, but both efforts proved fruitless. Such was the loyalty of the 506th to Winters that many among them voiced their discontent with Sobel's unfair treatment. They even issued ultimatums, demanding Sobel's removal or threatening to relinquish their ranks to Colonel Robert Sink, the unit's regimental commander. Sink, though unimpressed by this display, did eventually reassign Sobel, ushering in 1st Lieutenant Thomas Meehan as his replacement. With Sobel's departure, this band of brothers grew stronger than ever. On the fateful evening of June 5, 1944, Winters joined the ranks of hundreds of paratroopers descending into occupied France, primed for Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of Europe. Despite losing his weapon during the jump, Winters skillfully pinpointed his landing spot in France and made his way to the rendezvous point, gathering other downed troopers along the way. Lieutenant Meehan had fallen to German anti-aircraft fire on the same day, thrusting Winters into the role of de facto leader of the 2nd Battalion of the 506th. On July 1, 1944, Winters was promoted to the rank of captain and bestowed with the Distinguished Service Cross by Lieutenant General Omar Bradley. Later that year, Winters and the 2nd Battalion played a crucial role in the Battle of the Bulge, thwarting Hitler's desperate bid to turn the tide of the war. The 101st Airborne Division valiantly held off 15 formidable German units for three days until General George Patton's forces broke through the German lines, providing the 101st with much-needed supplies. Winter's exceptional bravery and leadership in Belgium earned him a promotion to the rank of Major. On May 5, 1945, the war in Europe concluded, ushering in jubilation throughout the free world. Winters yearned to return to America immediately, as he had accrued enough points according to the Adjusted Service Rating Score, a system used by the U.S. Army to determine repatriation eligibility. However, his departure was delayed, and it wasn't until November 1945 that he finally boarded a ship bound for the United States. Upon his return, Winters began his career at Nixon Nitration Works, a company owned by his friend, Lewis Nixon's family, in Edison, New Jersey. He gradually ascended to the role of general manager at the plant. In 1948, Winters married Ethel Estropi and wisely used, utilized the GI Bill, taking courses at Rutgers University. The onset of the Korean War in 1950 reluctantly brought Winters back to active service. Winters journeyed to Washington, D.C. in an attempt to persuade General Anthony McAuliffe, under whom he had served during the Battle of the Bulge, not to send him to Korea. Winters implored that he had witnessed enough war, but McAuliffe, recognizing Winters' extensive command experience, insisted on his deployment to Korea. Before heading to Korea, Winters successfully completed ranger school. However, he managed to resign his commission and stay at home. Winters and Ethel raised two children in New Brunswick, New Jersey. In 1972, the family relocated to Hershey, Pennsylvania, where Winters ventured into entrepreneurship, establishing his own business manufacturing animal feed. He eventually retired in 1997. In the 1980s, the members of Easy Company 506th Regiment held a reunion in New Orleans. Renowned history professor and author Stephen Ambrose learned of this gathering and secured an invitation. 
Surrounded by these distinguished men, Ambrose documented their stories and reminisces. For Ambrose, immortalizing this band of brothers in the written word felt like destiny. Initially hesitant, Winters eventually acquiesced to Ambrose's request to share his experiences, offering corrections to embellished stories from his fellow soldiers. In 1992, Ambrose's book, Band of Brothers, Easy Company, 506th Regiment, 101st Airborne, from Normandy to Hitler's Eagle's Nest, was published and met with resounding success. Renowned actor and producer Tom Hanks, along with director Steven Spielberg, captivated by the book's narrative, turned it into a highly acclaimed miniseries. Winters played an active role in the production, ensuring that uh, the events experienced by the band of brothers remained faithful to their actual experiences. The miniseries achieved remarkable success, earning an Emmy Award dedicated to the valiant men of Easy Company. Major Dick Winters concluded his journey on January 2, 2011, at the age of 92. In the following year, on the 68th anniversary of the D-Day landings, a grand 12-foot statue of Winters was unveiled at Utah Beach on the Normandy coast of France. This monument stood as a tribute to all the junior officers, like Winters, who had sacrificed their lives on that stretch of coastline. A duplicate cast of this sculpture found its place in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, where Winters had spent his childhood. 2. Lieutenant Colonel Ronald Spears In a military career spanning 22 years, Spears has been lauded as a hero, embroiled in controversy, and celebrated in both print and TV. Ronald Charles Spears entered this world on April 20, 1920, in the vibrant Scottish city of Edinburgh, he was the youngest among five siblings born to Robert Craig Spears Jr. and Martha Agnes McNeil Spears. However, his Scottish roots were soon left behind as his father Robert Spears embarked on a career as an engineer. Robert's journey into engineering began as an apprenticed engineer fitter in Glasgow, Scotland. During this time, he crossed paths with Martha McNeil and, in 1908, they sealed their union in matrimony. Their early years together were spent in Dalmuir, near Glasgow, while Robert honed his skills as a journeyman engineer. In 1908, a significant change beckoned for the Spears family. Robert secured a position at the Devonport Shipyard in Plymouth, England, where he was tasked with outfitting the imposing guns aboard Royal Naval battleships, including the legendary HMS Hood. While stationed in Plymouth, Robert and Martha welcomed three daughters and a son into their family. However, the winds of change blew again in 1918, prompting their return to Scotland, this time in Edinburgh, where Ronald, their youngest, was born. The armistice of November 11, 1918 marked the end of World War I and signaled the gradual decline of Britain's shipbuilding industry. Robert, observing the dwindling opportunities, witnessed many skilled men leaving for the United States in search of employment during the Depression years. He, too, decided to seek his fortune across the Atlantic, marking the beginning of a prosperous engineering career in America. Initially, Robert ventured into America alone, seeking employment in Boston with Hunt Spiller Company, known for their expertise in high-carbon gun iron. This move set the stage for the eventual reunion of his family. Martha and their five children embarked on the SS Winifreden from Liverpool on December 13, 1924, bound for Boston. Their journey culminated with a Christmas morning arrival at Boston Harbor, marking a joyous reunion. In Boston, the family settled in Suffolk County neighborhood, surrounded by a diverse community of recent immigrants, primarily of Scotch-Irish descent. Ronald spent his formative years in Boston, although there were notable interludes. Records reveal that during one summer break, when Ronald was transitioning from the 8th to the 9th grade, he and his parents embarked on a voyage back to the United Kingdom aboard the MV Georgic, part of the Cunard White Star Line, originating from Boston. 
This voyage included stops in New York and Galway, Ireland, before reaching Liverpool on June 25, 1934. Two months later, they returned to Boston. Ronald attended Boston English High School and graduated in 1938. It was during his high school years that he first encountered the military, as close-order drill instruction was led by two regular Army officers. They encouraged students to attend Citizens Military Training Camp during summer vacations, and Ronald participated in Citizens Military Training Camp Infantry Training on Great Diamond Island in Portland, Maine. Following high school, Ronald pursued further education at Bentley College, where he earned a certificate in accounting. This credential enabled him to secure a position as a junior accountant. Ronald Spears' first marriage unfolded on May 20, 1944, in Alderborn, Wiltshire, England. He met his English wife while stationed in Winchester, and their union took place in the quaint village church of St. Michael's in Alderborn. Fellow paratroopers Lt. Frederick Haliger and Lt. Herbert Viertel stood as witnesses. The lady Spears married was an Englishwoman, and their marriage marked her first. After the war, however, she decided not to leave her close-knit family in England to relocate to the United States. This decision weighed heavily on Ronald, who had a deep affection for her. This union resulted in the birth of a son, Ronald's only child. Despite their separation, Ronald maintained contact with his son Robert and remained an active presence in his life. Father and son shared moments like Robert's first day of preparatory school in England, and their bond remained strong as Robert grew into adulthood. Ronald's son eventually pursued a military career and retired from the British Army as a lieutenant colonel, a rank matching that of his father. Ronald expressed immense pride in his son's achievements. In the later years of his life, Ronald found himself disheartened by inaccuracies in the book Band of Brothers. He clarified details surrounding his first marriage, emphasizing that his English wife was not a widow as the book claimed. Despite their separation, Ronald continued to hold deep affection for her. The inaccuracies led Ronald to decline publicity interviews and request that any references to his first marriage be eliminated when adapting the book into a television series. His enduring love and concern for his English wife were evident, and he sought to protect her reputation. Following the war, Ronald Spears' journey continued. He sailed from England in January 1946 as company commander with the 82nd Airborne Division. Upon his return to the United States, he and his English wife were divorced under U.S. law. Ronald embarked on a second marriage to a war widow who had lost her husband in 1944. This marriage occurred on May 8, 1950 at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Records do not reveal when this marriage ended, but a third marriage took place on July 12, 1958 in Berlin, Germany. This union concluded with a divorce in 1966. The period between his 1966 divorce and his final marriage in 1987 remains shrouded in uncertainty, with limited information available about Ronald's personal life during these years. 3. Lynn Buck Compton Lynn Davis Compton, affectionately known as Buck Compton, graced this world on December 31, 1921 in the radiant city of Los Angeles, California. From an early age, he decided to adopt the moniker Buck because he believed it suited him better than his given name, Lynn. His mother, Ethel, worked for movie studios, and the youthful Buck even found himself as an extra in films. An interesting anecdote from those days involved him getting kicked off of the set of Modern Times after inadvertently ruffling the feathers of the legendary Charlie Chaplin. Buck was not just a film extra, he was an athlete of note at the University of California, Los Angeles. His prowess on the field earned him recognition as an all-conference catcher and an all-American selection in 1942. It's worth noting that one of his baseball teammates happened to be none other than the iconic Jackie Robinson. Buck's achievements in baseball led to his induction into the University of California Los Angeles Baseball Hall of Fame. 
His academic pursuits saw him major in physical education with a minor in education while joining the Phi Kappa Psi fraternity in 1940. Additionally, he donned the University of California Los Angeles football uniform in the 1943 Rose Bowl game. During his University of California Los Angeles days, Buck also answered the call of duty and participated in ROTC under the command of Cadet Commander John Singulab. In December 1943, he took the next step in his journey, enlisting in the Army and finding himself in E Company, 2nd Battalion, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, within the 101st Airborne Division, just in time for Operation Overlord. One of the standout moments in Buck's military career occurred during the company's heroic assault at Braycourt Manor. Under the command of Lieutenant Richard Winters, Buck and his comrades stormed a German battery equipped with four 105mm howitzers that were menacing Utah Beach. Their daring actions silenced the guns and sent the enemy scattering. For his valor in this endeavor, Buck was bestowed with the Silver Star. This harrowing feat is poignantly depicted in Episode 2, Day of Days, in the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. In the midst of battle, Buck threw a grenade with such precision that it struck a German soldier squarely on the back of his helmet. Later in 1944, Buck faced another perilous trial during Operation Market Garden. This ill-fated Allied mission involved seizing bridges in the Netherlands and crossing the formidable Rhine River into Germany. It was here that Buck sustained a gunshot wound through his buttocks, an injury that saw the bullet passing through sideways, entering one side and exiting the other. After a period of partial recovery, he returned to E Company just in time for the brutal Battle of the Bulge in the frozen Ardennes. During this tumultuous period, Buck was evacuated due to severe trench foot. Author Stephen E. Ambrose suggested that Buck had been deeply affected by witnessing the suffering of two close friends, Joe Toy and William Gaunar. However, Buck himself contested this notion, stating that while the horrors of the Bagstong had undoubtedly left an impact, he didn't believe he was clinically shell-shocked. In the heat of the moment, his thoughts were focused on helping the wounded and the looming threat of German forces. In 1947, Buck transitioned to the Air Force Reserve, serving in the Office of Special Investigations before moving on to the Judge Advocate General Corps. His military journey culminated with his retirement as a lieutenant colonel in 1970. Notably, in 1946, Buck opted out of a minor league baseball opportunity, choosing instead to dedicate himself to a career in law. In October 1947, Buck embraced married life, tying the knot with Donna Newman. The couple's union blossomed further as they lovingly adopted two children. Buck pursued a legal career by enrolling at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. His journey led him to the Los Angeles Police Department in 1946, where he embarked on a detective's path within the Central Burglary Division. In 1951, he transitioned to the district attorney's office, initially serving as a deputy district attorney before ascending to the position of chief deputy district attorney in 1964. Buck's legal acumen shone brightly during his tenure with the district attorney's office. Notably, he played a pivotal role in the successful prosecution of Sirhan Sirhan for the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. In 1970, Governor Ronald Reagan appointed Buck as an Associate Justice of the California Courts of Appeal. His esteemed legal career continued until his retirement in 1990, after which he found respite in the state of Washington until his eventual passing. Buck chronicled his remarkable life journey in the memoir, Call of Duty, My Life Before, During, and After the Band of Brothers, co-authored with Marcus Brotherton. On the occasion of his 90th birthday, a celebratory gathering in January 2012 saw the attendance of nearly 200 well-wishers, including actors from Band of Brothers, who had foraged lasting friendships with him. This included Michael Cudlitz, James Medeo, Neil McDonough, and Richard Spate Jr. McDonough, in particular, maintained a close bond with Buck, 
with his son earning the endearing nickname Little Buck in tribute. In January 2012, Buck endured a heart attack, and on February 25, 2012, he peacefully passed away in the comfort of his daughter's home in Burlington, Washington. His beloved wife, Donna, had preceded him in death in 1994. 4. Carwood Lipton Clifford Carwood Lip Lipton, born on January 30, 1920 and departing this world on December 16, 2001, was a distinguished officer in the United States Army. He served with valor in the 101st Airborne Division, specifically with the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 2nd Battalion, Easy Company. Carward embarked on his military journey in 1942 when he enlisted as a private. Through the crucible of European battlefields, he ascended the ranks to Company 1st Sergeant and was ultimately honored with a battlefield commission as a 2nd Lieutenant, a distinction he cherished as the highest of honors. Hailing from Huntington, West Virginia, Carwood's upbringing was marked by responsibility. Following his tr father's tragic demise in a car accident when Carwood was just 10 years old, he found himself thrust into the role of being the man of the family. His journey through higher education commenced at Marshall University in Huntington, but due to financial hardships at home, he left after one year. To support his family, he sought employment in war-related production, his path towards becoming a paratrooper was sparked by an article in Life magazine detailing the arduous training required for such elite soldiers. Motivated by the notion that only the best could join their ranks, Carwood enlisted in 1942. Carwood's dedication and leadership soon propelled him through the ranks of Easy Company. Notably, he assumed the role of Company First Sergeant shortly after the D-Day landings during Operation Overlord. Carwood's unwavering commitment extended beyond military strategy. He also played a crucial role in keeping the spirits of his fellow soldiers high, urging them to reach their full potential. This dedication didn't go unnoticed, earning him the admiration of officers within Easy Company, the 101st Airborne, and the 506th. In the lead-up to the D-Day invasion of France, Carwood and several other non-commissioned officers made the brave decision to relinquish their stripes and requested transfers to different companies. Their actions stemmed from a shared belief that their commanding officer at the time, Captain Herbert Sorbel, lacked the competence required for leadership. While Carwood and his compatriots faced some verbal rebukes, they largely escaped punishment. This significant decision ultimately led to the restructuring of Easy Company. Carwood Lipton served as the jump master for one of the C-47 Skytrains used by paratroopers during the Normandy invasion. He descended into Normandy and, with remarkable precision, rendezvoused with First Lieutenant Richard Winters, the executive officer of Easy Company, and other soldiers from the 101st Airborne, as well as a few from the 82nd Airborne Division. They were later joined by additional members of Easy Company and ventured just south of their intended target in Carrington. Carwood played a pivotal role during the Braycourt Manor assault, where Easy Company was assigned the formidable task of neutralizing four 105mm howitzers that were bombarding Utah Beach. These guns were initially believed to be 88mm, but the true caliber was discovered on site. Despite the challenges, Easy Company succeeded in destroying the four guns, and Carwood's valor earned him the Bronze Star. Carwood remained actively involved in key operations, including the assault on Carrington, where he sustained injuries from shrapnel, resulting in the award of the Purple Heart. His unwavering commitment to Easy Company led to a swift return to duty. As the company faced the need for reinforcements during Operation Market Garden, Carwood welcomed replacement soldiers with open arms, earning their respect and trust. He played a vital role in guiding these newcomers during the operation. Carwood was by Easy Company's side during the liberation of Eindhoven, and he participated as part of an advanced scouting team that surveyed a bridge ahead of the main force. Carwood Lipton fought tenaciously alongside Easy Company during their endeavor to capture Arnheim. 
When faced with insurmountable German defenses, he courageously traversed a perilous path through a German-occupied part of the town to relay orders for withdrawal. A small group of scouts stationed at a crossroads in Holland faced a dire situation when one of their comrades was grievously wounded by a German Model 24-style hand grenade. Easy Company was swiftly called into action, assigned to eliminate any remaining Germans at the crossroads. Although Carwood was not part of the initial assault team, he joined forces with Easy Company the following morning, rallying the rest of the troops. Their determined surprise attack resulted in the destruction of over two companies of SS troops situated at the crossroads. Operation Pegasus represented a relatively low-risk mission that involved Easy Company crossing a river on boats supplied by Canadian engineers to rescue more than 140 British Red Devils who had been stranded after Easy Company's withdrawal from Arnheim. Carwood and First Lieutenant Heiliger expertly oversaw the operation, leading it to a successful conclusion. Under the leadership of Second Lieutenant Norman Dyke, whose competence was questioned by the company, Carwood emerged as the de facto commander during their arduous trials in the Ardennes forest overlooking Foy. His steadfastness in leadership offered hope to the men who had lost faith in Dyke's abilities. After the successful assault on the town of Foy, Carwood received the long-awaited news that he would be granted a battlefield commission as a second lieutenant. This honor became official during his time in Haguenau. One of the most poignant moments of this service occurred when he bore witness to the horrors of the Holocaust at Landsberg. It was here alongside the rest of Easy Company that he played a role in liberating the camp. Carwood remained dedicated to Easy Company throughout the war, steadfastly standing with them until their dismanment after the formal surrender of both the Japanese and the Germans. He continued to serve in the Army Reserves during the Korean War, was, but was not deployed overseas again. Upon returning to the United States, Carwood pursued higher education, enrolling at Marshall University. He completed his remaining three years, graduating with a degree in engineering. Armed with this degree, he embarked on a career at Owens, Illinois, Incorporated, a renowned manufacturer of glass products and plastics packaging. His rapid ascent within the company led him to the position of chief operator by 1952. In 1966, he relocated to Bridgeton, New Jersey, where he assumed the role of administrative manager. In 1971, he and his wife ventured to London, where he served as the director of manufacturing for eight different glass companies in England and Scotland over several years. In 1982, he settled in Toledo, Ohio, and retired a year later from his post as Director of International Development. Carwood Lipton graced television screens through his appearances on two distinct shows. First, he provided his veteran insights for the popular HBO miniseries Band of Brothers, recounting the heroic saga of Easy Company. Additionally, he contributed to We Stand Alone Together, The Men of Easy Company, a documentary chronicling the remarkable true story of Easy Company. In the miniseries Band of Brothers, Carwood was portrayed by the talented Donnie Wahlberg. The final chapter of Carwood's life unfolded on December 16, 2001, when he succumbed to pulmonary fibrosis in Southern Pines, North Carolina. His departure left a profound void among the remaining veterans of Easy Company, and he will forever be remembered as one of the most extraordinary soldiers to grace their ranks. 5. Don Malarkey Donald Malarkey, who, with fellow members of E Company 506th Regiment, 101st Airborne Division, U.S. Army, parachuted into Normandy on D-Day, then fought onward through the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany, has died at age 96. An Oregon native, Malarkey was awarded the Bronze Star and the French Legion of Honor Medal, among many other honors, for his World War II service. Malarkey was portrayed in the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers by Scott Grimes. 
Donald Malarkey, born in the picturesque town of Astoria, Oregon on July 31, 1921, was a product of Leo and Helen Malarkey's union in 1918. His educational journey led him to graduate from Astoria High School in 1939, and he proudly traced his heritage back to Ireland. As a young man, he toiled on a purse signer crew navigating the waters of the Columbia River. His selflessness shone through when he volunteered as a firefighter during the devastating Tillamook Burn Forest Fire, which raised thousands of acres of Oregon timber. It was during his inaugural semester at the University of Oregon in the fall of 1941 that the course of his life took a dramatic turn as he bore witness to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. In the wake of the Pearl Harbor attack, Malarkey's unwavering patriotism drove him to seek enlistment in the Marines, but alas, dental issues thwarted that path. Undeterred, he turned to the Army Air Corps, only to find his aspirations hindered by a lack of requisite mathematical training. Consequently, in July 1942, when the draft beckoned, Malarkey willingly joined the paratroops of the United States Army. His inspiration sprang from a Life magazine article hailing them as the best. His rigorous training unfolded at Tamp Tocoa, Georgia, where one out of every six enlisted men earned the coveted certification as paratrooper. In 1942, Malarkey proudly received his jump certification. Malarkey became an integral member of Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment within the legendary 101st Airborne Division. His journey led him to England in 1944, where he played a pivotal role in Mission Albany, the airborne segment of Operation Neptune. This operation was an integral part of Operation Overlord and the largest amphibious invasion in history. Malarkey's medal shone as he parachuted into France alongside his fellow soldiers. On that fateful day, he contributed to a decisive battle, remembered as the Braycourt Manor assault, and for his valor he was bestowed with a bronze star. His journey through World War II was marked by 23 days in Normandy, nearly 80 in the Netherlands, 39 in the Battle of Best Gone in Belgium, and almost 30 more in the environs of Haguenau, France, and the Ruhr Pocket in Germany. His steadfastness and resilience culminated in a promotion to the rank of sergeant before the onset of Operation Market Garden. Remarkably, Malarkey, who miraculously evaded serious wounds, stood as the member of Easy Company who spent the most consecutive days on the front lines. For his service, he was decorated with honors, including the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, Good Conduct Medal, and the American Campaign Medal, among others. After World War II, Malarkey returned to the University of Oregon in 1946 to pursue the completion of his degree. His time at the university was not only marked by academic pursuits, but also by the meeting of Irene Moore, 1926 to 2006, whom he would later marry on June 19, 1948. In 1949, Malarkey graduated with a bachelor's degree in business. Settling in Astoria, Oregon, he took on the role of sales manager for the Lavelle Auto Company. His ambition even led him to a successful bid for the position of county commissioner of Clatsop County, Oregon, in 1954. The Malarkeys subsequently relocated to Portland, Oregon, where Donald embarked on a career as an insurance and real estate agent. The couple was blessed with four children, a son, Michael, and three daughters, Martha, Sharon, and Marianne. Tragically, on April 2006, Irene succumbed to breast cancer. In 1987, Malarkey's path crossed with that of author and University of New Orleans professor of history, Stephen Ambrose, during an Easy Company reunion in New Orleans. This encounter led to a journey in 1989, during which Malarkey, along with fellow Easy Company members such as Richard Winters and Carwood Lipton, revisited the European battlefields where they had once fought. Their first-hand accounts and recollections became the foundation for Ambrose's acclaimed book, Band of Brothers, published in 1992. During the book's creation, Malarkey shared the poignant tale of the Nyland brothers of Tonawanda, New York, 
This narrative, in which two brothers lost their lives on D-Day while another was presumed dead, became the inspiration for the screenplay of Saving Private Ryan. Malarkey called Salem, Oregon home and devoted his later years to engaging with high school and college students, as well as other groups, recounting his experiences as a member of Easy Company. He furthered his commitment by joining the USO in visiting army posts and hospitals across the United States and Europe, offering solace and support to soldiers wounded in the Iraq War. In 2005, he took a public stand in an advertisement advocating the repeal of the estate tax. In 2012, Malarkey chose to retire from public speaking engagements. Following the passing of Sergeant Paul Rogers on March 16, 2015, Malarkey assumed the role of the oldest surviving member of Easy Company. His journey came to an end on September 30, 2017, as he peacefully succumbed to age-related causes. He found his final resting place at Willamette National Cemetery, leaving behind a legacy etched in the annals of history. Goodbye to the men of Easy Company.